Syria is a very limited kinetic military operation with very good PR, yes, from the Russian point, from the Russian side. I mean, what the Russians did in Syria was that they had the kind of, they provided a, an air umbrella, like an air defense umbrella for, for uh, Assad's allies. Uh, for a period of time that saved him at that particular dark moment for him where he was about to be ousted or killed. Um, and everything afterwards was PR. Everything afterwards was, you know, it, it was a, a whole load of, uh, of, um, of words about really not, not a lot on the ground. And I think that this is uh, also the kind of coordination that Israel had with Russia is that the Russians did, um, they um, were willing to use force in Syria and they were willing to come to the Israelis and to negotiate to negotiate with them some kind of uh, terms of uh, cohabitation in this uh, very small space. Um, but what did the Russians really, I mean, what, how, how did they provide the Israelis with anything? I mean, it's hard for me to see that, yes. Um, and, and I come back to this issue of, of um, the Russians kind of allowing Israel. What would the Russians do to stop Israel? Would the Russians confront Israel? I mean, when they confronted Turkey in the beginning, in November 2015, it didn't work very well for them. And they realized very quickly that they can't really confront Turkey in Syria because Turkey is much better positioned in terms of its deployment. So, you know, we have to kind of reconsider when we say Russia is moving things, it's a power broker in the Middle East. There is a lot of posturing, a lot of PR here. And I think this PR really had a massive effect on the Israeli strategic discourse and created a sense, a false sense in Israel that Russia somehow is, is, is giving Israel some kind of assurances about what is happening in Syria. Russia gives no assurances to anyone. Russia does what's good for Russia.